And so it's great to have Dawn Scott here uh, as our featured uh, speaker, and we're going to talk in just a few minutes. So, so welcome, Dawn. Welcome. I'm happy to be here. Such a delight to be with you, Bob. We have a really long history together in terms of our retreats. We do. We sat, we sat we, we're trying to figure this out, maybe about, about 10 years in a row. Yeah, yeah, we overlapped for about 10 years. Yeah, yeah. I was actually, as I was driving here this morning, I was trying to remember, I think we sat on the same side of the room together for many years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know how, how weird that is? When, you walk, when I walk in and I, maybe you also, I tend to move towards the left rather than to That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's there, right. Of so I think, you and I, I think you and I <laughs> sat together for years on the left side of the hall. Yeah. I know. this, And I think like we're like we're pretty close. The mats were pretty close at different times. What's really amazing to me is how you get to know someone really well before yeah. you speak to them. Uh, yeah, in the silence, there's something that's communicated. It's true. Yeah. So when you reached out to me about Dharma Voices for Animals, I didn't know much about your organization, but I just instinctively trust you and um, anything you're a part of. I'm like happy to support. And um, it just so happens that it's in alignment with my own values. So um, just thanks for calling me in and giving me an opportunity to to embody my values and, and the things that are important to me. Yeah, well, thank you. Huge thanks to you. I mean, this is so, um, you know, you can, by helping us, and you've been an amazing, wonderful light of uh, inspiration uh, for us. And by doing this, you're, uh, you know, enabling us to make all these connections around the world and save animals. So this is going as I have owe you a huge uh, uh, oh. thanks and amount of gratitude. I'm so, so happy. You, you, know, you didn't know about Dharma Voices for Animals. I also didn't, didn't know that, that you were vegan until, until Guy, yeah, Guy, to told, Guy told you this summer. Yeah. So, um, and that's been quite a journey. I know you and I have talked about it a little bit. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so we're in, I, let me do this. Let me just give a little of your bio that okay. I have. For, you probably know this. You probably should do it rather than me, but it's only appropriate. And, and yeah, that I, I have it. So I have a few notes. Let me do that. And then we'll just continue talking. And then the intro that I was going to do, let's hold it off till the end because I want to tell people just about some updates. But let's wait since we're okay. talking already. So uh, <clears throat> Dawn Scott, I'd like to introduce. And uh, Dawn, so first to welcome you formally uh, to, to DVA is, is a uh, Dharma teacher, DVA Dharma teacher. And also you're going to be working with us uh, in our project. So I, I will make that announcement. We're officially starting our U.S. Centers project. So this, we've been doing this informally for, as you, know, you and I talked about, for 10 and a half years now. You know, Patty started out as co-founder, Kim and David and I. So we, you know, we did informally behind the scenes, talking to cooks and kitchens and, and have really got, um, uh, I think, encouraged a lot, of, a lot of positive change. But now we're gonna do that on a bigger scale. And this week was the first week for our director of the US Centers Project, Carrie Thompson, who's uh, in, uh, in Santa Fe, actually in Taos, New Mexico, carries on the call. And we'll be hearing from her. You'll, everyone will be hearing from her soon. So now she's just trying to see what's, what's out there, see what her plan is. And this is what we're going to be doing. This is already what we've been doing in Vietnam, Thailand, and Sri Lanka, really putting resources and time into countries. So now we have four countries. U.S. is going to, U.S. centers will be hearing a lot from us as we try to find ways uh, to work together towards diet change. Um, so Dawn uh, is, is going to be working with us on that, um, you know, talking to different centers and different teachers and all, which is the only way we're ever going to have the confidence and trust of centers to make change. You can't just, right? You can't just say, oh, by the way, you should be vegan. I mean, yeah, it's vegan. really about the relationships that you have with a lot of these centers and um, calling on a shared values and how to live that. So happy to be a part of that. And I think I already have an assignment. <laughs> we, uh, you do have, have one. We, have yeah, we will, we'll make that public. Uh, at the, right, exactly. So I think yeah. really good things are happening. Uh, this is a big center that is uh, very close to, uh, to moving 100% plant-based. 
and Dawn's been uh, working behind, behind the scenes on, on this one. Um, okay, so then just the, the rest of the introduction, people should know a bit about you. And I'm gonna add this because it's not, not in our official bio, but I just found out the last time we talked that you were uh, an aspiring act, actor. Act, I guess you don't say actress, <laughs> actor. Yeah. Um, so can you say something about that? I think this is really, uh, not surprised oh, to hear well, that. But. Yeah, what to say about that? So I am, um, as a young person, I really loved uh, singing and dancing and um, theater. And <laughs> I loved musicals. I really loved musicals. and. I just thought I was born in the wrong era. So um, I had mentors and mentees who would take me to see musicals. I, my first musicals that I saw were A Course Line, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And I really, I took those, there's a deer. Oh no, it's a neighbor. Um, I took those musicals pretty literally when I was a kid. So I would, was expecting at some point that I'd walk around the corner and everyone would be singing and dancing. It never happened. <laughs> but um, I, I studied voice and um, did a lot of theater as a young person with Marilyn Ostepsky, um, just a local um, uh, uh, artist who supported young people and cultivating their, their, their gifts as singers and dancers and actors. And uh, I eventually went to acting school. Eventually went to acting school, I got a full scholarship to this wonderful um, conservatory. And what was cool about that conservatory, and there are different schools that I was auditioning for, but what was cool about this conservatory is they had low flying trapeze as their movement component. And I thought, this is the school I wanna go to. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then I actually started sitting retreats during my first year there at the at this conservatory, at the National Theater Conservatory, and was falling in love with the Dharma. So I would um, go to school for the for that year for nine months, and then I'd come back to Spirit Rock, Marin County, in the summers, go practice at Spirit Rock, and. Um, I'll never forget it. I was in New York. We were doing our showcase. Our class was doing our showcases. And your showcases, um, you showcase your work for agents and directors. Um, and this is a way to just get started in New York. And I had some agents that were interested. Um, I went to some of those interviews. And I just felt called to come back to the Bay Area and practice. So I came back here and I also had a sweetheart here. So that was a, another pull to come back to the Bay Area. And I just thought, well, I'll do theater here in the Bay Area and um, just continue practicing. And I, um, I just was falling in love with the Dharma and continued practicing. And it just became clear, like, this is what I want to do. Like, I just want to practice. So and sitting the month long and the two months with you all those years. Yeah. I'm well, I'm happy you made that choice. You probably Me too. Thinking about Me too. <laughs> this, uh, and, and everyone <laughs> listening to us uh, today, uh, I'm sure is really happy, but it's really interesting. I'm not surprised to listening to your, I think you gave four or five, uh, no, uh, it was two or three. So I should say yeah. that the August, um, you were teaching and I was a yogi at the, um, the uh, Concentration awareness rock. retreat, yeah, exactly. three weeks. It's yeah. for rock. Just uh, it was the first retreat in person for about yeah. a year and a half, uh, and and, so, and you and you gave maybe three Dharma talks. During three that. talks. We each gave three talks. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and so then when you told me that you had um, that you were an actor at one time, you were training to be, and were doing this, um, I wasn't surprised. I mean. So, so that yeah, I mean, some some people I've seen a lot of sitting so many years there, twenty four years or something at Spirit Rock. Some people are you know quite naturally are, are um, intimidated by speaking in front of people. And I remember so, not easy. You know, it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's not easy, and you know this as an as a trained attorney, like yeah, yeah, it's it's. I, tell me a little bit about your experience in learning how to you know speak publicly yes um 
So I took a public speaking course in, uh, in uh, college as at University of Illinois. And it was good. You had to get up there and give like six speeches during the one semester course. It was pretty terrifying to, to do that. Yeah. A lot of people in the class had to be graded for it. You had to use visual aids. I'd never done that before. So I did it. I, kind of, you know, I just did it because I had to do it for the, for the class. And then it, it gets easier each time. This, I don't know if yeah. you have your experience. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been my experience as a just being in the Dharma seat. of like, the more I do it, the more ease there is. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you do see, and the point is in front of a hundred plus people and then the teachers and the cooks and the caretakers and all, they come to watch the Dharma talk. So you have a pretty big audience there. You yeah. just, I mean, you seem very, you know, very comfortable talking in front of, yeah. uh, in front yeah. of, groups of people. So I wasn't it, surprised to hear that you had acting experience. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely there as a support. I think what I'm recognizing is when I just, tap into and rest into what it is that I want to share, um, the nerves start to go away. Yeah. And it's just about communicating and sharing on whatever topic it is that we're exploring tap that night. Tapping into what it is you want to share. There's something about that. It's like a pause. there's a pause. So I, I love the way you described that. Mm -hmm. there's a pause in, in my experience if, you, if you're trying to think about what it is and plan it and, and trying to do that while you're while one is talking it's really hard it gets in the way yeah. it doesn't sound yeah. authentic but it's yeah. kind of like what we're doing now i'm feeling it we're just talking mm -hmm. yeah we're just talking yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. That, that's really the key so that's great but it's mm -hmm. you, you, you have a lot of training to do that so mm -hmm. i wasn't surprised to hear that you uh that you were an actor so let's so let's transition to to veganism so you're you're a vegan can you tell share with us your your journey this way you know, back when you were being raised and growing up and food and all this <laughs> as, we, as we talked about this, this yeah is, we talked about this a little bit so yeah. um i was telling you the other day i mean i was raised in a black household um my i was raised by three women my grandmother my auntie and my mama and my grandmother's was born in mississippi at about the age of eight, she moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and she loved to cook. So she, during the Great Migration, when she moved from the South, made her way out here to the West Coast, first to Vallejo, and then um, her husband was a, a mechanic in the Air Force. So um, he worked at uh, Hamilton Air Force Base in Novato, so not far from Fairfax, where I am. And um, at the time, African Americans could not live on the Air Force Base, so but they could live in Marin City because it was predominantly black at that time. So my grandmother moved her family to Marin City with her husband, and uh, she brought with her all the things that she loved cooking. So um, country fried steak. Uh, fried chicken, she had a wonderful fried chicken recipe that my auntie then you know, later on learned how to cook. And so that's how I, I came to love fried chicken. And then uh, let's see, gumbo and ham hocks and greens. So when I was little, I was called the meat eater because I just loved meat and I loved ribs and did not like eating vegetables. like. I had to, you had to cover broccoli and cheese and butter for me to even be interested. So that was the kind of context that I was raised in, in terms of food. Um, and it wasn't until I started practicing that um, I started to really consider um, what I was eating and the impact that it was having on the lives of animals. So I started out just as a vegetarian. So I would, um, <laughs> I'm laughing because in my, uh, my acting program, there were 10 of us, and of the 10 of us, four were black. So we would, um, sometimes we'd go out to go have ribs and, uh, I remember making the choice during school that I was gonna be a vegetarian. And I remember them like uh, laughing at me and being like, oh, this isn't gonna last. Um, you love meat just as much as us. 
And um, I, I really stuck to it just because I, I just felt for these beings. Um, and I, and it, it just occurred to me like I can get sustenance from other sources and need to actually eat these beautiful beings. Um, actually, I remember because I used to work at Spirit Rock. So in addition to practicing at Spirit Rock, I used to work at Spirit Rock in their family program. And I remember it was right after a retreat. So the beautiful thing about having worked at Spirit Rock all those years is they allowed me to go sit the month long or the two month retreat every year. So I'd close down the family program, go sit retreat, and then I'd come back to work. So I had sat a retreat, probably took a day or two off and then went right back to work. And I remember driving into work after this retreat. So there was some, there was some mindfulness, still some momentum there. And as you're driving from downtown Fairfax to West Marin to head out to Spirit Rock, just before you get to Spirit Rock on your right-hand side, there's a, a meadow, you know, this meadow. And Ned Flanders and his cows are out there it was early morning, so uh, most of the valley um, was in shade and this meadow was mostly in shade, but there was starting to be some, sun, some sunlight in the meadow. And I remember seeing this cow kind of get up and start to lumber and it looked like the cow was heading for the sun. And I thought, you know, if I was a cow, I would want to be in the sun too. And it just, it hit me that uh, animals value their lives just as much as I value my own life. And that really, um, that's when I knew I had made the right decision to be a vegetarian. So I was still eating eggs, I'm still drinking milk, um, um, using honey. And then in 2017, to Nisera and Kitasaro offered a, we called them Thanksgiving retreats at that time. It's now called the gratitude retreat. Um, and to Nisera, as you know, that uh, vegan, um, I believe you even had her on this uh, part of the Dharma. Yeah, yeah, uh, so she was our Dharma uh, Voices for Animals. Third, I think Dawn, she was our third speaker. You were number okay. six, yeah. six now. And also yeah. she's been a part of our US Centers project and a Dharma teacher member of DVA. And, all, and also, <laughs> so, and, and so is uh, Kitasaro is, but Tenisara has yeah. been really active with centers and kind of yeah. helps with a letter, drafting her letter and stuff, yeah. Beautiful. So um, in a way, both Tenisara and Kitasaro were a part of my decision to become a vegan because at this retreat, I'm assuming they advocated, then they asked Spirit Rock to serve vegan meals while they were there or a vegan auction. So it's around Thanksgiving. Um, the retreat um, starts before Thanksgiving and ends after Thanksgiving. So in the middle of the retreat, there's this huge feast that um, the kitchen, they do such a beautiful job and what they offer. And they offered a vegan option, a Thanksgiving vegan option. I remember looking at all the food and actually um, preparing a plate for myself that was all vegan um, food. And I just, I thought this is possible. Like this is what's possible with a vegan meal. And I thought, okay, if this is what's possible, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> so it's been quite a journey. So that was November of 2017. So it's only been about four years since I've been a vegetarian or a vegan. And in those four years, um, I really had to learn how to cook for myself because um, there are more vegan options in the world. Um, but if you're gonna eat a vegan diet, um, you really need to know how to um, 
make sure you're getting the right minerals, make sure you're getting complete proteins so that you're combining the appropriate foods to get all 21 amino acids. So it's been quite a journey in learning how to um, kind of live, live my values, kind of live, live into like, I want all beings to be safe and well. And this feels like uh, it really supports that. But um, then there's the day-to-day -day of like, okay, how will you um, eat and just learning how to cook for myself, which means slowing down and not being so busy and creating time to figure out how to create meals that are nourishing, that aren't harming other beings. And um, it's been really good for me, really good for my heart. Uh, yeah, really good for my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, th thanks a lot for sharing that with us. Uh, uh, I really, uh, I really enjoyed and, and like it. I just uh, really connect with your story. I can see par parts of that, like just seeing an animal that w is going to wind up on someone's plate. Mm. See, see, seeing them, I, I, I had a, uh, something similar. It was actually I was up in Napa one time. I went up early. Uh, before a uh, retreat at Spirit Rock, and uh, I was I was running runner back then, and and I was out there somewhere around where the farms are, and there was a um, uh, a calf was separated from its its mother, and yeah. well, and they're both making and they were like running towards each other, and, and they're both making lots of sounds. I don't know yeah. how it happened. And, the, and then they, and then they were nuzzling and all, and then mm -hmm. the calf was staying really close to the mother after that, as I watched it, I ran around and I came back around the other side of this uh, grazing area. And it's just, just seeing, I mean, I was, I was vegan already by then, but it, it just, just actually seeing it. So it's not just a, um, a concept that oh. said, don't, don't kill the sentient being, which is of course important as a starting point, but actually to see that animals want to live as, as much as we do and they want to be free yeah. from suffering. And it's they sort of, have loved ones that they have a connection with that they want to be with. And yeah. yeah. So so now, so now you're you're official, you're a Dharma teacher, you're teaching everywhere. So I didn't, you know, my, so let me put through just graduated. It's funny. It's so right, funny. But like the first year, it's so you know, we're staying in email contact, we were con uh, contact, we were um, talking about this, we had some other things that we had to talk about DVA stuff. And I and I know that when I'm going to email you the first time, I'll get an email message. They'll say that you're you're teaching a retreat or sitting a retreat, and that is, I mean, you're, you are almost non nonstop, twenty four seven, as they say. Yeah. So you're teaching us a few of the highlights of what you've been doing. So you're a graduate of uh, Insight Meditation Society's teacher training program. This is like is this a four or five year program? I think, huh? So it was a four year program. We started in August of 2017. And we just wrapped up uh, this past May. Um, and none of us knew, I mean, who who foresaw the global pandemic. Um, so the pandemic really ended up shaping the last two years of our, or the last year of our training. That was, um, that was kind of heartbreaking. <laughs> and there were beautiful things that came out of it. Um, and the fact that our graduation was on Zoom, it was online. So people who would not have been able to participate and wish us well and be a part of the, the celebration of our cohort were actually able to attend. Um, and that was that was really special. Yeah, so yeah, that was a four year training really? with 19 and, and other wonderful what, people. And this has been going on for a while and a lot of the teachers now in, in, the, in, in the Vipassana Theravadan tradition in, in, in the West, IMS, Force Refuge, Spirit Rock, our graduates, for lack of a better word, of this yeah. program. Yeah, and it was very special in that it was, uh, IMS really, has a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the majority of the trainees were BIPOC, um, uh -huh. Black Indigenous people of color, um, people who do not identify in the gender binary, which is also really important. Um, and 
going through that training with those I don't know how words they were just really special humans and uh, they are special people and uh, we're bonded and connected in um, just through that experience um, and it's beautiful to see the different ways that we're serving the dharma um, my friend Shelly who was in the training they're now the co-guiding teacher of common ground and that's a new development we'll be celebrating them December 19th um, yeah we're all just serving in different yeah. ways so and, it's and, pretty and, and, and like you're saying I mean it's really important because the, pe the people train so if you're uh, if you're training a di diverse group of people then that means that in the future there will be a diverse group of teachers in, at least in, the, in the west so yeah, this is the, training. Like the university is training people to go out in the professional world so this is really important the people that are chosen to be in their program so it, and it, so it, and this is the way it is if if if, yeah. if if the training isn't um, uh, isn't reaching out and inclusive of, of diverse folks then the teaching won't be either so I mean, this is really important. And this is a you know, fairly recent change, but you're you're part of that. Now, it, so. it, it is. And what's exciting is um, we're starting to see some of the fruits of these various institutions who have said, okay, we really want to um, be in alignment with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that first retreat at Spirit Rock that um, we were both a part of, that you sat and I taught, almost half were BIPOC almost wow. half wow yeah and that's that's really um it's unusual it's lovely it's beautiful so we're we're already starting to see the fruits of long efforts that um spirit rock and ims have been putting into this work yeah so anyway you right. the this, whole this is great man. yeah and, okay the, so now you're just like a training. relay race right so you handed yeah. the baton, yeah. the baton yeah. and then you and yeah. then you're gonna, you know, I, I know where you're coming from, and you'll continue this okay. this um, this contemporary tradition of spirit rack of diversity, inclusion, and equity. So yeah. this is really important. Yeah. Good. So this is this is great. So now. Uh, why don't you just finish? I keep, you know, every time I know, I just keep quiet, interrupting. No, 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 you're not interrupting at all. This is actually, um, uh, I, I feel it's a, um, it's, 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 it's a really, I think it's, people are going, oh, this is, what are they doing? But I think it's like really a good, uh, really a wonderful um, uh, uh, interview because we're, we're just talking and that's it. And I'm not, I'm not sitting here. And sometimes I was just interviewed for a, it was actually for a Taiwanese, um, uh, not Buddhist, but a vegan organization. And the per I didn't know the person very well. And they had like eight questions. They sent me the eight questions. And she went, okay, so when did you start? And then I answered the question. And then she went to question number two. You yeah, know, yeah. It's okay. Not a lot of give and take. Yeah, yeah so I, mean, there's, I think, that for, at least for me, but I hope other people are experiencing it also that way. It's okay. much more interesting. Okay. But what's interesting is that we keep getting, I want to like tell people a little bit more about, you pretty much hit all the highlights. There's a couple more things here. You've really, just in your first year officially teaching, um, like you're doing so many different things. So what, what, what we, I just want to, I want to just finish this for a minute. Then we'll get back to, uh, to our free flow exchange. Uh, also your core teacher at Spirit Rock's advanced practitioner program. We're calling what? it LEAP. It's called Liberation oh, Through yeah. Emptiness and Awareness Practices. Yes, it's oh. called LEAP now. Advanced practitioner pro uh, program, that advanced practitioner program, that sounds a little, um, I think it's intimidating for some people, but calling it LEAP, Liberation Through Emptiness and Awareness Practices, really kind of gets to the heart of what it is. And Sally came up with that acronym and it's perfect. So, oh, it's good. Yes. It is good. I, well, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. And that wasn't around. I was in the, you know, the dedicated practice, actually the first one, and then uh, Community Dharma Leader, the third one. And wow. So this is new. This, I mean, this is new, relatively new. It sounds great. And so you're a core teacher that they, how many, um, like, uh, how long has this gone? Is it a couple years? It's a year long. Um, year long. And the core faculty are Sally, 
Armstrong, Susie Harrington and me. And then we invite teachers in. So Gil will be a part of it. Um, Gil Fronsdale, uh, Brian Lesage, Guy Armstrong, Jaya Rudgard, uh, Venerable Analia will come in. Um, he won't fly in personally, but he'll um, come in via Zoom. Let's see, is there anyone else I'm missing? So May Elliott will be an assistant. Francisco Gable will also be an assistant. Uh -huh. um, they were in the previous iteration of APP. It's a, it's just an exciting group of people to come together to actually um, offer teachings that um, we don't normally get to hear or practice with mm -hmm. um, these more liberative practices around emptiness and awakening. Um, I think Philip Moffat will also be a part of, of this teaching team as well. So really excited. Oh, this is great. So I mean, I mean, I'm so I'm happy you told us a bit about the content because mm -hmm. I actually didn't know this. Mm -hmm. so. And it, it'll start in 2023. So it's it's not starting anytime soon, which is great. 2020 what? Three? 2023. Yeah, yeah. 2023. Okay. So people could go to the Spirit Rock website and sign up. Now, emptiness is uh, also described as anatta or anatta in the Buddhist teachings. So this is, you know, if you're into um, uh, practice and a lot of people uh, with us on, the, on our call are, just take a look at the website and you can... Yeah. Take, so there's time to, to register and all that. Then you also mentioned the family program, uh, family program at Spirit Rock. But you were the coordinator of that uh, yeah. for, for, for eight, eight years. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and then with that, you had the opportunity to to sit retreats, to participate in retreats. People don't know what sit is. Participate huh. in the retreats. Um, so that was for eight years. You were immersed in this. In this. Yeah, I was really fortunate. Really, really lucky. It's uh have served that community for eight years. So to serve um, parents and then children and parents and uh, middle schoolers and teens, we had a, a two annual teen retreat. So we would take a group of teens every year out to a Gary. So we take about 15 and um, I'm just seeing some notes that are coming in. Um, Okay, we'll we'll get to those. But you can, and you, by the way, you can just jump on any of those if you want. And then towards, I thought towards the end we'll pick up on some. I have a few questions I've written down from uh, from the chat from from the yeah yeah yeah. So also, you can pick some the answer too. It's totally fine. Okay, great, great. Oh, we still yeah, got so more the, time. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, so that, that's, I mean, that sounds like a great program. It brings together the different generations and, and all. You, you, you pay attention to, to young folks, and, that, and then they, you know, then it becomes a family thing for, met, for many of them, not for all of them. Yeah, you know? yeah, and the fact that young people, people as young as six and eight years old are receiving these teachings, right? Yeah. Like, um, and that it becomes a huge part of their frame of reference and the privilege of having been a part of the family program for eight years and still being in contact with the families and the young people that I met during that time is actually seeing them grow, seeing the trajectory of their, their life thus far and seeing how the Dharma has shaped their choices. So young people deciding um, that they're going to go into environmental science or that they're wanting to do um, a, a young woman who um, had a choice to go into finance or um, as I said um, environmental science and she said she really wanted to to live her values that um, were shaped by the dharma and it's just a privilege to have been a part of that and to see the Dharma actually shaping young people's lives and also um, starting to see some of the young people that I worked with in teen retreats come back as young adults to sit um, adult retreats like that's totally rewarding. Like there's a one young woman who attended our teen series and all of our teen retreats and I saw her name on a retreat that I'll be teaching in January in an adult insight retreat. So um, just a 
a privilege just a privilege to have supported and serve that community and to see the Dharma still shaping their lives. Yeah. This, when you're, as you're describing this and sharing this, um, what we came to mind is that, of course, we don't live in a Buddhist country. And so DVA, Dharma Voices for Animals, is doing work, as you know, in three Buddhist countries, Thailand, mm -hmm. Sri Lanka, and Vietnam. There's something, approximately 140 million Buddhists in those countries. So mm -hmm. they have, you know, we have a program in, in Sri Lanka. What we've done for many years is we do presentations. We've done almost 500 um, of those presentations at the so-called Sunday schools or Dhamma schools. 80% yes. of the, yeah. 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 Of the uh, Buddhist children in the country, there's 15 million Buddhists in Sri Lanka, self-identified in a recent um, census that was done and so it's 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 a family thing it's a community thing now here it's more you know so that's why i like what 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 you're doing with with spirit rock is kind of um uh, integrating uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. The, yeah. the practice in, in in life so you just don't go on a retreat and then you come back home and then everything is the way it was you forget that practicing the precepts anymore which mm -hmm. lead, which actually leads me to um to, question I want to ask you about about that so you know we and we've talked about this so we have you know yet the first precept you've got karuna or compassion wise livelihood some people you know, maybe not so clear how wise livelihood applies maybe if we have time we could talk a few minutes about that so we have the, the, the buddhist teachings about about respect for all human uh, or for all sentient beings mm -hmm. and uh it, i mean it seems pretty clear we know that clearly a chicken a turkey a fish a, a cow a calf or, or, or sentient okay. beings there's really no dispute on that so what what is what is it like since you you've transitioned and you're you've aligned your heart with 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 the teachings what's it like to um to you know, to go to a center where let's say people aren't really talking about this I mean, a lot of the teachers a lot of the western teachers of course are not even vegetarian let alone vegan mm -hmm. Just, just, just say, just yeah. share with us a little, a little yeah. bit about what that is. Yeah, yeah. Just in terms of my own heart, there's a real, a lightness, um, and a sense of a relaxation. And I mean, this is so important for the development of our practice, like the lack of remorse and the joy that comes from that. In the Buddha, there's this beautiful passage in the Anguttara Nikaya where he goes through all of the conditions that give rise to full awakening and all of the conditions that give rise to a, a concentrated mind. And a concentrated mind is a, a mind that's quite happy. And um, the Buddha directly points to what supports happiness is living an ethical life, having a heart that's ethically attuned and uh, not harming and not killing uh, living beings, sentient beings is a, a huge component of living an ethical life, of having a heart that's ethically attuned and a heart that resonates with um, what will actually be a support for not only myself, not only other beings, but for all life, for all life, living that ethically attuned heart. And in terms of my own practice, there's a real lightness in knowing like, I didn't kill any living beings today <laughs> and I'm not going to. And through the food I eat and the clothes that I wear, um, I, um, I'm not harming living beings. Like that feels quite important. In terms of your question more directly, going to centers where um, they're still offering, so most of the centers I teach at or that I practice at um, are offering a vegetarian option, not, and then Spirit Rock more lately, uh, I've been seeing a lot of vegan options, which is really great. Um, but, uh, uh, I certainly don't want to come in and start dictating to other people what they should and shouldn't be eating, right? So I really want to respect um, 
the health conditions that people have, it may be necessary for them to get their protein from uh, eggs. Um, I'm really, really grateful that I'm actually teaching at centers and practicing at centers that do not participate in the, the death of, of um, cows and fish and pigs and chickens. Um, and I, I really, it feels important to me to uh, not come in and project my values onto someone else's, into someone else's life. Um, this is tricky. I mean, isn't it? It is really, it is a nuanced thing. Like, I, I don't want to harm beings, and I've yeah. taken that practice on myself. Um, and I think it, it, what's wonderful about practicing at a center that offers only vegan options, and there's one in Santa Cruz that does, mm -hmm. is a, it, it can show people what's possible, that you can eat well, that you can eat really tasty meals and not harm anybody, not harm any living beings. And I think um, the centers here in the United States have an opportunity to, to do that, to kind of demonstrate like what's possible. Um, and I know there will always be exceptions for people. There will be some people that need to get their protein um, from sources that are from living beings, and I don't, I don't approve of it for myself. But I, I don't want to. Yeah, I, I don't want to start dictating someone else's dietary, their diet. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's it, so, so, certainly people think that they need to. So that that's that's, that's a, right. Whole, that's a whole that's other right. Thing. Yeah. And yeah. you also said about when it's available. So there are places, although in the countries that the other countries are working in Thailand, Vietnam, and Sri Lanka, uh, there's you know, there are alternatives. But you know, people out in villages, people that don't have much many resources, it yeah. it is really difficult. But then, if we come to the U.S., for the most part, people coming to the centers have you know have certainly. A, a great deal of choices that could they could choose non non harming, but you also we you know we have to respecting wise speech and all you can and and it's just so ineffective. So I like what you said about you can't dictate. There's no way. I think maybe just it just um, inviting people to to look at this. Can, can can you consider this and being a an example, being a shiny example like you are. You know, you don't have to say you know, do this or do that, but just. Just your 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 own practice of plant based non harming is a shiny example. But then people need to to know that. So you can't go up there and say, "Hey, look at look at me, look at me, look at me like that." But we can't. Dharma voices for animals can shine well, a light. That's, on you. Well, that's a really. I actually. What would it be like to incorporate this into a talk? Yeah, please that, um... do. This is so. Cool. <laughs> but it has to come from you. So, yeah. so, so yeah. just to just to, uh, I think I mentioned to you, uh, Stephanie Swan. So she's yeah. the founder yeah. of, and I forgot yeah. the name, but it's a big Vipassana Theravada Center in Atlanta, Georgia. So if people are watching from out of the U.S. and joining us now. Um, uh, Atlanta, Georgia is in the South, considered the Deep South, and she—that's where she's born and raised. And so she and I had a really great long talk three months ago it, during their talk i didn't even say anything she said oh I, that she really needs to give a dharma talk about about this she's been a vegan vegan activist outside of dharma circles for a long time so she did so she said here i'm gonna do it on this oh nice yeah Charles. actually i think it's up on your site yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's, it's up on your site. And I was like, talk. I need to listen to that talk. <laughs> I was really, should, yeah, really, really excited should. to go listen to it. And, yeah. And I invite everyone to listen to it. It's it's really good. Uh, Charles Rubin, our communications director, posted that. And uh, yeah, so take a look at that. So what yeah. so there's three ways that Dharma teachers it, but it has to come from within. So it just mm -hmm. sounds like it just came came from you. Three ways that you can make an impact. It, it, kind of in in a um no, in a way, in keeping with the precepts and and not dictating to people. One is to self. -identify. No, not dictating. No, no not self -identify. dictating. Self-identify. I mean, yeah. Just to self-identify and find appropriate place to do that. 
So, <laughs> so some teachers, so one vegetarian teacher will say, not vegan, vegetarian, will say that he went to this Pauk Sayadaw's uh, uh, retreat uh, uh, center in, 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 in Burma when it was possible to, to do that before the, uh, the recent uh, major problems there. And it, he, it was okay because it was, they had only vegetarian food. There was, so, so just planting those seeds the uh, second is to mention something because you were saying you were saying this. This doesn't you have to be a teacher. Just just having some relationship with a center or the Buddhist community or Buddhist yeah. and respect the precepts and compassion and all. Just to, to say what it is as you were, you've been telling me. Just to say, it's an elevator speech on that. You know, just like two senses. A yeah, word yeah. is in the Dharma. Yeah. So you told me it's precepts, compassion, whatever you want to yeah. say. And the third thing is, and this is a little bit asking maybe a little bit more, but I, but for me, this is if I got invited to speak in the Dharma Center, this is what I would do. Since I'm vegan, I was vegetarian for many years, vegan for the past I think 17 or 18 years, I think right. it is now. Is is that what that when a teacher is either their own, if it's their own place, it's different, their own Dharma Center, but they're invited to teach, then just to request that the food that's served to everyone is the food that's served to, to the teacher. So sometimes you hear your stories at some centers where they're, they're serving hamburgers and chicken, but there's a veg, vegan or vegetarian uh, teacher, and then they have a special meal off to the side. You know, I just I would like everyone yeah. to eat that food mm -hmm. so that there's no harming because of my, my presence. So I just, these are like mm -hmm. just three guidelines. Yeah. Yeah, those are wonderful guidelines. Those are wonderful guidelines. And I, um, right now my heart's just been attuning a lot to compassion and compassion practice and um, social justice has been a, I, I care about it and I find ways of um, integrating it into my talks. And um, In a way, I mean, you could see this as a social justice issue. Right? Yeah, exactly. It is. Yeah. It is a social. And how to how to so I can feel my heart even right now, like in my mind, like, well, how could you incorporate this into your? I, I plan on giving some talks on compassion um, within the next couple of weeks, and maybe I've got some talks to re rewrite. This is great. Yeah. Uh, this is great. <laughs> First, listen to, as you're thinking about this, listen. To yeah, Stephanie. I'll listen to Stephanie Twans. just to see um, how she approached it. And, mm -hmm. um, and one thing she did, yeah. you and I were talking, we haven't said this directly, but it's that it is, it's not easy to talk about this. And it's, it's mm -hmm. a taboo. Well, in a because it can time. be so polarizing and it doesn't exactly. need to be because um, exactly. you just want to... Um, well, it just doesn't need to be polarizing. And what I, I mean by that, I just, I feel like we're living in a time that's so polemic and so conflicted with vaccines and politics and um, candidate, candidates. And it just seems to be the, within the zeitgeist of our times, this kind of conflicted, polemic, um, uh, fractious time. And, um, I don't think this conversation around uh, our, our dietary needs and wanting to live into our values, it doesn't need to be conflicted. It doesn't need to be, um, I'm not afraid of tension. Um, actually, I was with some friends last night and we were talking about, uh, we were talking about, oh, we were, ta we were talking about romantic relationships, but then the conversation started to uh, move into um, some of King and, King and Gandhi, King and Gandhi and nonviolent principles, those six principles. And in King's letter to Birmingham, or his letter, um, Birmingham, that he wrote, it's a nickname, um, letter from Birmingham jail, uh, he talks about what's called a negative piece and a positive piece. Mm. And a negative piece, um, he said, it's the absence of tension. I'm gonna paraphrase here. It's the absence of tension um, that gives way to injustice. Whereas a positive piece is filled with tension, 
but it's the tension of um, really looking at, he doesn't use these words, but coming close and getting proximate to Dukkha, having an honest direct encounter with Dukkha, actually being honest and truthful about the tensions that are in the field. And just as we were talking about earlier, like uh, the different, um, it's such a nuanced topic. Um, so being honest about some of the, the tension that's there and then finding ways of being in beloved relationship around that, that result in justice, that result mm -hmm. in equity and um, a welfare for everybody involved, all beings. Um, and it doesn't, I'm hoping that as I rewrite some of these talks, wow, it's already happening. <laughs> as I rewrite this is some it. of these talks. You can you'll that, get the um, recording of this and then you got your talk. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. <laughs> um, but as I'm hoping that as I kind of rewrite these talks and start to incorporate some of my lived experience around this and perhaps how the how the teachings actually support um this precept of not killing living beings is very clear. That That is the precept. Mm -hmm. but we can do it in a way that's not about shaming and blaming. It's more of an invitation to explore this terrain for yourself. And it doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't need to be fractious. It doesn't need to be, uh, yeah. I just feel like there can be so much shaming and blaming and that's not the beauty of Kingian, Gandhian nonviolent action, the six principles is uh, the root is about coming into right relationship after an injustice of some kind, after there's been a kind of um, a rupture in the relational field. And you could say that our relationship with animals, how we've used them is a, a rupture in our relationship with them, right? Like there's this basic, I mean, one way that Venerable Nanalio talks about metta is it's just this basic agreement that when we meet as two beings, that we will meet each other with friendliness. And if that's the agreement between humans and between humans and animals we've we've we haven't kept to that that agreement that um friendliness that benevolence that well i'm not going to harm you and you could see the uh, living in accordance with that first precept um and just speaking off the cuff here. So what's, what's the point I'm coming to? That this, that living as a vegetarian or a vegan is a way of trying to mend the rupture in, that, in those relationships. Like I know my species has caused a lot of harm and just know that um, there is benevolence here and I don't want to harm, cause harm to you and your species. Uh, and that if within the frame of um, Kingi and Gandhi and nonviolence, uh, coming into right relationship with animals through um, living as a vegan and living as a vegetarian feels like a social justice issue in some way. Yeah. Be uh, beautiful. Wow. Yeah. This, and yeah. you just came up with this. I mean, some of the things you're saying about this relationship and the trust and all. So th this is um, just it's beautiful. So I think you got you have your Dharma talk and just and <laughs> I mean, or your 10 Dharma talks. I mean, this is this is really it coming from your heart, thinking about that and that analyzing just it just came out. This is perfect. This is, it has so many things in there that are really, really important. So for sure, I completely support you and encourage you. To, and, well, and thank you to for just planting talk. the like seed. Oh, thank you for planting the seed. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, so to, I, I'm going into a semi-retreat this week. 
Oh. Um, so I'll be practicing in the mornings and then the evenings and then writing in the afternoons and then tending to um, admin stuff also in the afternoon. So uh -huh. yeah, it'll be a time to explore all of this. Yeah, thank you. This is, no, this is great. Yeah, yeah, please yeah. let me know, keep me posted. and we can, I will we actually, can maybe I might give you a call and just say, hey, I'm thinking about this. What yeah, do you think? <laughs> Now you've got my number, so give me a call. It's, per it's perfect. And then, then it'll be on Dharma Seed if you're doing it at, at one, right at one of the centers. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. others can listen to it. And then we can link to it. And so it's beautiful. What's the safety? So here, I, I like this. Uh, it says, teachers who follow the first precept in their food choices are more credible to me. I like framing non-harming as a gift of safety to other beings. So there's yeah, a teacher. Yeah. I heard I heard a talk by Mark Coleman that, um, that, that the preact practice of, of not eating animals is a practice of dana or generosity. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it sounds like focusing, sometimes instead of focusing on, on, on the harm, which is, we have to start there. And that's what the Buddha mm -hmm. has to do, mm -hmm. is to tune into, uh, into dukkha, Four Noble Truths. But sometimes just to, to reflect on the, the, the good, the non-harming, the, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, support of life, that we're doing when it, 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 even if you're transitioning to vegetarianism or transitioning to veganism, you're changing. Just instead of thinking about what where you're what you are still doing and don't want to do anymore, or what you're you want to get rid of, look at the at the lives you're saving as you're transitioning. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's mercy, that's generosity for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really I love that you're bringing this up because the Buddha actually encourages us to reflect on the the wholesomeness, the beauty, the skill of our ethical actions, of our um, ethical behavior, and actually reframing it. Because, I mean, there's so much that's the times that we're living in, they're just so turbulent. And um, it can, I think people have talked about the climate crisis and uh, trying to motivate people through fear, it doesn't quite work. It doesn't work. It's just, we want to bury our head in the sand. But if we start to frame it in terms of the wholesome, the beautiful, the kusala, which has this meaning of a beautiful, good, a skillful, the kusala, like really um, framing this first precept as a, and the Buddha talks about this. I forget what suit it, suit it is. Whoops, it's a yeah. big run. Okay, we're okay. I'll just let that pass. It's just oh, a okay. helicopter going overhead. Oh, yes, sure. Um, it's okay. It sounded like someone but, talking, but anyway. Oh, no, it's a helicopter. Oh, okay. So um, I, that's passed now. Um, but framing this first precept as offering the gift of safety, and there's a, there is a sutta where the Buddha talks, frames all of the precepts, not just that first one, but all of the precepts as um, offering the gift of safety um, and reflecting on that. And that's what I was saying about my own heart feeling like there's this lightness and this like the goodness of like, I haven't harmed any living beings today. I don't plan on harming any living beings today through my, the foods or the clothes that I wear, or the things that I purchase. Um, and that that allows the heart to relax. Um, and there's a field of trust. I think that kind of radiates and emanates from you. Um, I'm just thinking of uh, a monastic that I know who you could say he like lives in a a menagerie, um, except he's in his kuti and all of the he's got this huge window in his kuti um, that allows him to see all the beings who are um, in the area that he lives in and. Uh, he has had some pretty close encounters with bears and raccoons and deer and very friendly encounters. And I think it's the result of one, his years of practice, the depth of his practice. Um, actually, that's right, we went for a walk. That's right, we went for a walk. And uh, 
we were just checking in around practice and we stopped uh, near a, a meadow of cows and one of the cows just came up to him and then he he was just rubbing the cow behind his ear um and i i think this is just my personal opinion this um the depth of the practice and the fact that he um, eats a vegan diet as well. I think it's a vegan diet, definitely vegetarian. I think it's vegan. Um, and then all of his years of practice, like that cow felt his trustworthiness and the mm -hmm. raccoon that visited him. Um, it's such a wonderful story. Um, there was a trustworthiness that these animals, I think, felt and allowed themselves to get close to this human. Mm. Um, so yeah, we do offer the gift of safety and framing it as that and like, oh, I could live into the possibility of living, like I could embody, I can be a safe space and a refuge for all beings. And um, that is a gift it's and feeling the goodness of that. Lovely. And and this is what why we practice metta, right? To to, mm -hmm. to share this friendliness and safety and peacefulness and happiness mm -hmm. and health mm -hmm. with others. And so that, but then when when we do the opposite, if we're eating animals, we're we're certainly mm -hmm. not practicing metta. Yeah. And all. Right. so you could, it's it's like it's almost like what I thought. What I just thought of as you're, you're uh, as you're uh, speak, telling sharing this is really really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Is that not what I'm thinking, but what you were saying? It, what, what I was, um, what I what I thought was uh, how it's easy. It's so much easier. Heart connects to met to practice when we're not causing this harm. We're not part part of this terrible yeah. killing chain. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. We, can, we can we can we can share meta with with all, with mm -hmm. all things. Because yeah. a lot of people, a lot, a lot, a lot of folks who are ethical leaders come into Buddhist practice and they hear the metta prayer, the, the mm. metta phrases, and it's a, to all to all sentient beings. But at the same time, when they go to the to the lunchroom and then um, uh, uh, food that comes from the suffering of animals is served, and so it just it cuts into the it it, it's, it, it divides the metta the the, the 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 metta words from the actual practice. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right, and it um, the whole point is to live into these teachings, right? To embody them yeah, fully. It. Yeah, it's the practice, and it, I love what you said before, just a little while ago, about about peace, about the practice, and, and quoting the Buddha, how the practice um, uh, flourishes when there's peacefulness and non-harming with the individual that's the point yeah. of the sex so it's, like yeah. can, it's not something separate from the practice it's no meditation it's integral it's foundational like one of the first things that the buddha taught um with anyone who was new to um this particular approach towards freedom was generosity and ethical conduct yeah those are the first teachings and even the gradual path starts with generosity and ethical conduct or the gradual training i'm sorry not the gradual traffic gradual so, training so somehow you're going to help us figure and we do we come up with different things we try things and they don't and we do so just different ways of um of being able to communicate this and you know just sticking with the u.s we got lots and lots of low-hanging fruit and even more difficult oh, challenges yeah. just think of just ways and, and you're going to embody this when you're when you're out there you do already and, and then we'll we'll work together and we'll see other ways that we can do it do this yeah. i don't see a lot of questions a lot of wonderful comments such as yeah, uh, yeah the other side. P pcrm.org great website for recipes and information on nutrition mm. nutrition's committee okay. for responsible medicine there's another one on that, another uh, message on that, climate disruption. You know, it, it, so the two, I think the two issues that play um, in the U.S. More, more than health. Health is really, really big in Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Vietnam because people there are almost unanimous. People that are, that are eating animals 
in animal products are almost unanimous in thinking that they absolutely need to do this because of health. So they're in those countries are spending a lot of time to uh, talk about, about, uh, about medical and scientific uh, uh, evidence and, and studies like the China study, et cetera. In the US, uh, we get into these long debates about health, even though we know, you and I know, it's uh, you know, by far the healthiest lifestyle we could have yeah. based yeah. on yeah. whole food. So we, but we seem to do better with, with uh, compassion and harming on the one hand and environment on the other hand. So this is, these are just strategies that we talk about, but for sure, all three of these major areas, compassion, and harming one, environment two, and health three are, yeah. are, are just right there. Yeah, it's just the sure. it's just a vegan diet, and actually not just diet, but like the products that we buy is really a support yeah, exactly. for all three. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for saying that, clothing, shoes, mm -hmm. clothing, mm -hmm. shoes, and, and, and all. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, I think. So great, great comments. We're reading all of them. Dawn's reading all of them. I'm reading all of them. Awesome. Yeah, them. climatehealers.org offers a paper explaining that animal agriculture is responsible for 87% of greenhouse gases. That's, I have a friend who um, said she became a vegetarian for that reason, just the impact on the climate. And the United Nations study back in 2007, yeah. so, so many of the leading scientists in the world, the greatest producer of, uh, uh, of, of carbon and greenhouse and greenhouse gas uh, emissions is the number one industry is uh, factory farming and 40% more than more, uh, more of a negative impact on the environment than all of the transportation, all the cars, all the planes, all the boats, all the buses, et cetera. So you know it's pretty it's pretty strong. It's not like it is. Three, it is. It's like three reasons to mm -hmm. be plant based and four reasons not to, or five one. It's like everything, including preserving of the Amazon rainforest and war and water, uh, which is going to become a, a really um, scarce commodity and, and for future generations. All these are reasons to be plant based, and it so. We're getting somewhere with your help. And uh, this is great. Dawn, this is great. Anything you want to say at the end? Um, just a conclusion or? I guess what's coming to mind is just the way that I started. Um, Bob, I'm just so grateful that you called me into Dharma Voices for Animals, that I can um, yeah, use my life and my energy to. Um, be a safe space and a refuge for all beings. So, so thank you for calling me in. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you so much. Uh, this is what you're, what you're doing, what you say, and the way you embody this is uh, inspiring for me, and I think for a lot of other people. So thank you about uh, for, for, for that, Don. We'll, uh, we'll be in touch. Now you got my yeah, phone number. Yeah. I also I, have I, yours. I'll we'll, be writing a talk, so I'll give you a call. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It was, it was great to spend this time with you. Such really, a delight really. to be with you. Such a delight to be with you. And thank you, everyone who was on the call today. I can't see you, but I could feel you through the, through the airwaves. And um, yeah, thank you for caring. Thank you for caring. Thank you so much. And so it's the end of the year. My last, just a few, few words. Um, you know, we, we're, we're a nonprofit, so we, we need your support. Uh, we yeah. have some wonderful monthly donors. You can go to the website, donate now. We're going to send out two more emails before the end of the year with, with some updates, exciting updates. And I don't even think I mentioned this. I do have to mention this. Did I mention that we started uh, we, yeah, this this week, uh, Kerry Thompson, New Mexico, started as our director of our U.S. Centers project? Yeah, yeah, Did I say yeah. that? Okay, so this, so this this is it. So you, you'll meet Kerry, I'll introduce the two of you, and then um, you know, we'll, we'll work together. And I think it's so, you know, please support us if you if you if you can and if you're moved to do that. Uh, so, we, you know, we don't sell products, we don't sell services, we rely on donations. We have, we're doing major work. We will, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes in the U.S. 
and you'll see some of the results of that. And we're doing, and we have been for years doing major work in Thailand, Vietnam, and Sri Lanka, 140 million Buddhists, and they listen to their teachers in those countries. So we're working with the teachers to tell them, stop eating animals, stop eating animal products. So take, you know, go to our website. If you haven't been there, take a look, please support us if you can. Dawn, <laughs> thank you so much. Such a delight to be with you. Thank you.